fate. Okay. So first of all, I'm very happy to, uh, to be part of your PD day and with the title Realizing Self-Directed PD. I think this is really important that PD, of course, should be... Um, another aspect of PD, and that is being involved in the organization of PD, and how that can also, I feel, benefit you in your professional development, whether it's in the classroom, or whether you want to go into administrative roles, or maybe even into management. So, let's go back to the reasons why I think we should join a language teacher association, because here I'm focusing specifically on this aspect of uh, PD, actually joining a language teacher association, as for example, we had in the past TESOL Arabia. Uh, of course, this can help us develop to develop before, beyond the confines of our master's degree or our doctorate and so on. And it can have knock on benefits for all the various stakeholders. So if we actually are improving as professionals, this benefits students, institutions, and even the local educational sector. And we hope that improved teaching quality would lead to improved learning. That's the, the real reason why we do it, I guess. What I'm gonna focus on here though is why or how we can contribute to a language teacher association beyond just attending. Very often we attend, we listen, we learn, but I feel that another part of our development can also be, uh, be actually getting involved in the organization of the language teacher association's work. So this often is an altruistic desire to give back to the profession. So you actually want, you want to give back to the profession that we are involved in. And it might help us meet our needs of belongingness, of self-esteem and of self-actualization. So that the higher end needs of, um, of motivation can be realized by becoming involved in a language teacher association. Um, I actually conducted a little study about this and that's what I'm presenting today and why did I just decide to do this well firstly I was asked to contribute to a, a book on language teacher associations and I thought about this in the context of leadership and management and uh, my own development in that in that regard and I'd never really reflected on it I, I'd taken up on um, you know administrative positions I'd been involved within with a uh, Arabia for many many years but I never really uh, reflected on how I had actually improved my leadership and management skills. It also gave me the chance to do some autoethnography, which I've never done before. So it was a new kind of research for me, researching the, the self, using my own story as data to try to come up with some, something meaningful to say. Now, just before I continue, I, I do want to point out that... Um, here I'm going to be using the, the words leadership and management interchangeably. So they do have different functions normally. One is seen as transformational, one is seen as executive. However, as McCaffrey argues, these are not mutually exclusive at middle management level. And that is where I have done a lot of my managing and leading. It's been in the middle, you know, where they punch you from the top and they punch you from the bottom. So that's where I am. And uh, that, so therefore, I'm going to be using these words interchangeably. If I say leadership, I'm also meaning management and vice versa. So what I want to do is to start with a professional autobiography. This actually was part of the study. And, uh, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about the study and how I actually approached um, um, this study. And most importantly, I'll come to the thematic reflection into the perceived benefits of involvement in a language teacher association. And finally, I'll come to the conclusion. If you do have any questions, I think because of the, the technical aspect of this presentation that we're doing it virtually, it's probably better if we save the questions until the end. But please, if you have one, jot it down and I'll be happy to answer any questions or just listen to your comments uh, at the end. And we can hopefully have an open discussion about some of the things that I'm going to say. Okay. So let's start with my professional autobiography, the school and university years. That little boy down there on the right is me at age seven, I think. Uh, that jumper was knitted by my mother from my memory. I've got those lovely 1970s collars and, uh, <laughs> and the 1970s haircut. I'd say growing up, I was quite a shy child, you know. Uh, I tried to 
show this maybe extrinsically through quiet self-confidence, but ultimately I was very, very shy. Looking back, I would say that I was approachable and I was someone who was quite reliable. So teachers could rely on me, my, my fellow students could rely on me, which I guess are kind of management traits. I did try to assume student rep duties right through my schooling, through primary, right through to tertiary. And also before I went to, to college, I did do part-time work and full-time work. In fact, I didn't do particularly well in my, in my school uh, exams. So um, I had to struggle a little bit to, to, get into, to get the grades that I wanted to get into university. But I got there in the end. I studied German studies at Portsmouth University in the UK. And one part of that study was going abroad to Germany for one year. And that was the, you know, that was the, the quantum leap, if you like, in my self-confidence, actually going abroad, working in another country, and so on. So I felt this real surge in self-confidence during that teaching assistantship. So what about other work that I've done before I joined the Language Teacher Association? Well, when I graduated, I went off to Spain, and I worked for a few years in language academies. And then I took over one of the academies. It was a very small one, just two teachers. And I ran it for three years. And that was really a university of life experience. <laughs> it was really a, a struggle because I had no management background. I had no leadership. Well, leadership, maybe I had some, some attributes. Uh, but it really was a tough, a tough gig, if you like. I did it for three years. The, the market was very, very low at that time. There wasn't a lot of uh, demand. And I learned a lot just through, through suffering, I guess. Uh, eventually, I sold the school at a, at a small loss, so I didn't lose out too much. But it was, it was a great learning experience, but in, in a very stressful environment. From there, I went to Holland, and I went to a Dutch service management university where I taught business communication. So I didn't really take on any leadership roles there, although I did mentor international students. And what was interesting there is that they, they practiced problem-based learning. So all teachers, regardless of discipline, they had to actually tutor content sessions. And our students were management students. So therefore, I actually had to read quite a lot about management theory and leadership. And I got the chance to interact with students talking about these particular topics. So this established for me, I guess, a little bit of expert power, what they call expert power. Basically, the um, declarative knowledge that you gain through, through study and through reading and so on and so forth. Uh, also, before I, went, I joined the Language Teacher Association, this, uh, the Dutch University, they sent me out to Qatar. Now, this is, I'm now in Qatar for the second time. This was my first time in Qatar. So we set up a branch campus, which as you can imagine, starting from the beginning, was very pioneering, very small scale, and we all had to, had to wear a lot of different hats. So I was shifting furniture at the same time as teaching, and then eventually I started to get involved in other leadership roles. For example, running departments, being involved in strategy and marketing, and also because I had a little bit of background in tutoring management, they also asked me to lecture management at lower levels. So that's why when I did my master's degree, I decided to go down the road of educational management in TESOL. And I completed that in around 2008. So what about the uh, work that I had did at the same time as I was actually involved in the Language Teacher Association? My, my association with the LTA was eight years. So during that eight year period, this is what I was doing. I left Qatar and moved to the UAE to pursue my doctoral studies. Uh, and the job I got there was a teaching, teaching post, a regular teaching post. Uh, I then moved to university and carried on teaching, but I was lucky enough to do some master's teaching, and that included lecturing educational management, and I also got involved in teacher training. It was at this point that I decided to join the Language Teacher Association beyond just being a regular member who just turns up to the conferences and so on and so forth. Uh, as you know, TESOL Arabia, which is the one we're talking about, is very, yeah, it's very much centered in the UAE. And so I saw lots of opportunities to, to get involved. And this kind of filled a void for me. I'd come from a, a sort of a supervisory position and I missed it. So I wanted to get involved in the LTA to, to fill that void. After seven years in the UAE, 
finally in my work, I, I returned to a departmental leadership position. I graduated with my doctorate, looking for a change. I moved back to Qatar and what was available in Qatar was again to going back into teaching. So I had to relinquish my LTA position because you had to be living in the UAE in order to, to hold these positions. So again, I gave up that position and I was no longer managing. But after one year where I currently work, they asked me to move back into middle management with my current employer. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the reason that I'm giving you this professional autobiography is to give you some background into what comes later when we talk about the thematic um, outcomes of the study which I conducted. So with this study, I was looking basically to see how volunteerism for an LTA enhanced or to what extent did it enhance my leadership and management skills and attributes. I worked within an interpretive paradigm and used an exploratory approach. This is the, generally how I like to, to do my research, but this time I used autoethnography. So I was basically analyzing myself, trying to reflect on things that had happened to me in my life. I used a multi-method sequential approach Basically, I started by doing a documentary analysis of everything that I could find written down, which was linked to my, my, uh, my posts in leadership and management, but also my work for the LTA. And I used this and I analyzed this to therefore to, to conduct some introspective reflective recordings. So what I did, first of all, I scanned all the subject lines of every language teacher association related uh, email that I had sent that was about 1100 and all document titles linked to my work with the LTA which is about 357. I then converted these into two con conceptual activity mind maps. One was focusing on my my career and the other one was focusing on my work with the language teacher association and these both guided the structure for the ensuing reflective recordings I analyzed the, the data from those recordings. So the raw data transcription was about 15,000 words. And this led to five themes for reporting. So the themes that came out of my, of my analysis were the following. <clears throat> uh, these are the areas I feel where I have most to say about how being involved in the LTA impacted my leadership and management skills. So starting on the right hand side, we have knowledge, then responsibility, skills and attributes, feedback, and finally, as always, we have the challenges. Um, I'm gonna go through each one of these in turn, and where possible, I'll try to explain how my involvement in the LTA has washed back into my, into my work. So what have I learned from the LTA, or, or how have I enhanced my skills through the LTA in order to help me do the current job that I am doing? So let's go, let's go with number one. Number one is knowledge. <clears throat> Now, as we know, declarative knowledge is very important. Formal degrees, background reading, and you can argue that it's also key to performing well and gaining respect. So people expect you to have the knowledge behind the job that you're doing. But also PD, such as training and attending workshops, is a very, very important part of, of gaining knowledge and building on the knowledge that we already have. And I think knowledge and contribution is also really, really important. For example, Within the LTA, I started, like many people do, by visiting uh, um, events or conferences, then contributing to them by presenting, and finally getting into the, the stage of organizing events. Also, pre uh, presenting your work is also a good way of developing, I feel, professionally. Whether you do it within the association or outside the association, it's a good thing to do because uh, you, can, you can grow from that experience. Uh, the great thing about the LTA was the, the different opportunities it, give, it gave you to, to pick up new knowledge and new skills. So I got involved in reviewing conference proposals and association journal submissions. And also it gave me a great chance to publish my own work, to do research and to get it published regionally as well. Uh, this, all, this, of course, all builds into a research profile. And this is really crucial when you're assuming any sort of educational management position. But even if it's at a, the level of um, classroom teaching or lecturing, somebody who has this background in their research profile is putting themselves in a very good position in the, in the workplace. 
Another thing that I want to add here regarding knowledge is the knowledge that you get from observing others, especially other people who are operating in a, in a language teacher association, especially in the management of it. You, can, you get the chance to see both good and bad practice. And so you can learn from that as well, like this person behaves this way and that is something which seems to work. So therefore, I should try to emulate to a certain extent what they do. And it, I think if you, if you are involved in these kind of associations, the people who are at the top, they, they really do work hard. I mean, this is what I really, really notice. They combine hard work, dedication, and I think humility. It's very, very, very important that somebody at the top is not someone who's boasting all the time, but is someone who's there. Because remember, in, a, in an LTA, you are serving your fellow professionals. It's not about the position. It shouldn't be anyway. It should be about service. So let's move on to the second point, which I think came out from the, from the data. That is the one of responsibility. Of course, the more responsibility you get, the better you get at uh, having that responsibility and doing the right things. And also, assuming responsibility in voluntary organizations seems to be increasingly valued by employers looking to recruit leaders. Uh, and leaders can be leaders at any, at any level. It doesn't have to be just at the top. It could be other people who are going to be involved in administration of courses and so on and so forth. I think most employers all need practical evidence of somebody's ability. So normally in any job, before you're given responsibility, you will be mentored, you will be, uh, maybe uh, you'll, you will um, shadow someone on their job, a kind of cognitive apprenticeship model until you're given that responsibility. But before I joined the LTA, I think this was the case. In most places where I worked, based on what I did, based on how I uh, carried myself, people, first of all, made sure that I was able to do the job, and then they gave me the responsibility. In the LTA, it was, it was exactly the same. I didn't come into the LTA saying I want to get involved, and they suddenly gave me a very high position. I started you know, at the bottom just doing little things like presenting and submitting my research. Eventually I did minor committee work and then I went to chair a, a special interest group, the teacher training special interest group. After that, after they'd seen that I could actually you know, operate quite, quite well, they then were more comfortable in offering me other options. So for example, I was asked to be the SIGS coordinator for the whole country. So that was managing all the special interest groups right across the UAE. And then I took on the running of the special sessions at the annual T uh, international conference. The third area where I feel, you know, I've really benefited from being in the LTA is the, the enhancements of skills and attributes, or if not the enhancement, the, yeah, getting new skills and maybe, um, maybe learning new attributes from scratch. Naturally, of course, you become a better oral communicator. You're talking much more often. You are communicating via emails with lots of people and so on and so forth. So I think this naturally develops. Your self-confidence develops. I mean, I think we all can remember those of, if you presented in a conference, most people can remember the first time they presented and how, how scary it was. You know, if you're just standing up in front of your peers for the first time, and some would say this is more daunting than teaching, you know? Uh, so you get more confidence, of course, through, through doing these kind of things. And I think it also helps you to focus on this aspect of volunteer, volunteering and taking on positions within a voluntary organization where you are serving other people. So it's not about you, it's about other people. So you, you do become more service oriented. And I think humility is an integral <coughs> part of that. And hopefully it can be developed. Uh, as you go through that particular uh, aspect of, of the work. But I also think it's important, and this is something which I, I, I try to operate in my own career, is in the internal customer approach. So within teaching, when I'm, when, if I'm running a department, they often say it's all about the students, it's all about the students. From my perspective, I don't see it that way. I see it as being all about the teachers. And my job is to serve the teachers to help them to do their job well. If I do that, then they are on the chalk face. They are at the front line. They will then give the service that we, that we need to the students. So this is also something which I developed while I was in the LTA, organizing the SIGs. I had to try to support the SIGs in, in their work to help them do a great job. 
Another thing that uh, was really noticeable was, of course, the, the fact that volunteers are not employees. So you, although you don't want to sort of be a dictator in your work, you have a bit more authority because of your position. In a voluntary organization, you don't. So you need to develop a, a transactional leadership style, you know, trying to, to sweeten uh, things to try to get people to do what's, what needs to be done. Because after all, they're doing it out of the good of their heart. They are not uh, getting paid for it. They are volunteering too. So referent power and charismatic leadership skills need to be developed, I think, in these particular situations because you, you, do not, you do not have the legitimate and coercive power of a paid management position. A really, really important thing, I think, in any uh, LTA is this drive to innovate. And that's something that I find very, very positive about uh, my involvement with uh, the LTA. In a... Um, in a normal work situation, often you are, you are bound by the shackles of bottom line economics, and this can stifle change. In a voluntary organization, people are coming up with lots of great ideas that they can't do at work and just implementing them. And generally speaking, people will say, yeah, go for it, do it. So this is a really, really positive aspect of an LTA. Now, my main outlet for innovation was in organizing the conference special sessions. So it gave me the chance to, to bring in the discussion and debate sessions, chat show formats, TESOL quizzes. So it was a really, really enjoyable part of my involvement and really helped me to develop my ideas and to, to learn how to, to innovate. What's been the washback to my current work situation? Well, I think it's given me a sensibility of the need to propose and encourage new ideas to create buy-in uh, from, from teachers, from internal customers. And this, in, in turn, I feel gives more collegiality, it gives a sense of ownership of what the department is doing. Very often you hear pe people complaining about PD and about uh, new ideas. Well, I don't believe in it and uh, nobody asked me and so on and so forth. I do my best now to try to get input from the team. And uh, a lot of the things we do are not necessarily things that I think is the best thing to do. But if the team thinks it's the right thing to do, then we'll go with that. I think instilling pride is, is also a really important skill uh, in a voluntary organization, but you can, that can also wash back into the workplace, of course. You need to support people, to empower them, to trust them. Uh, gratitude can imbue solidarity and support. And in the case of the LTA, I think this was a, the, the, the direction I took, because when I took over the SIGs, they were considered by many as the problem child of the organization. Everyone was saying, oh, the SIGs are out of control, they don't follow the rules, and so on and so forth. I could, have, I could have gone down the iron fist approach, but I thought, no, let's just go down the approach of reviving their self-worth, giving them lots of uh, praise for the efforts that they, do, that they do, and I think this was the right way to go. Don't forget about yourself. If you do get involved in any sort of coordination, or, um, uh, uh, or if you're currently doing it as well, uh, it's really important to celebrate your own achievements. It can be a tough sometimes when you're having to oversee other things and um, listen to, to other people and try to meet the, the needs of people above you and below you. So I think it's really important just to, to give yourself a pat on the back. You know, it's a good in, intrinsic motivational tool and it can counterbalance the stress that often you, you, you will get if you end up in a leadership or a management role. So the wash back into my, my work is that I do try to focus not only on the process of running a department in, in, in my current job, but also focusing on positivity to raise quality, hopefully, and to raise morale. We move on to point number four, feedback. We can learn a lot from feedback. Um, we want the feedback to be positive, but sometimes the feedback is negative. But we have to accept both aspects of, the, uh, of, of, uh, of this, uh, this theme. Now, regarding the feedback that I've received regarding my LTA work, I would say, you know, that, that sometimes it's tangible and sometimes it's very, very nice. Um, I received a professional service award for my work, which was a great feeling of pride. And also in the place I was working at the time, back in uh, the UAE, they awarded me a teaching fellowship based on partly on the work I've done in the LTA. So that was very nice feedback. But it's the smaller and more frequent forms of feedback that clearly show the level of your worth to an organization. So it's really important to, to always solicit feedback about how things went and um, you know, encourage people to, to point out how you think you can improve in your work. 
the, anytime you're given responsibility, that is also indirectly a form of feedback. People are basically saying to you, we think you can do the job. That's why we're giving you this responsibility. So that's always nice to hear. I, I've included networking under feedback. I think because the whole process of networking gives you such a chance to interact with people that you learn from them and you, and you get the opportunity for feedback. I want to give you an example from uh, my involvement in the LTA about how networking can kick on from one thing to another. So originally I was a member of TESOL Arabia when I lived in Qatar and then when I moved to the UAE, I, I, st I started to present I think at conferences uh, and so on. But then some friends of mine who were running a SIG, they said, can you join the SIG? And I said, well, I don't really know. It's not really my field. They said, it doesn't matter. We just, you're our friend. Come and join us. So that's how I got involved in the SIG. Now, after two years, they all decided that they wanted to leave the SIG and I wanted to continue. So then I took over the SIG and I got a new team in and we started to co-host events with other SIGs and with regional chapters. So this gave me a chance to make acquaintance with fellow professionals. If I was presenting, um, if I was presenting uh, as well, I got the chance to showcase my research in these events. And I guess through exposure, you start to get more offers. So people will suddenly ask you to present at conferences abroad. You get targeted requests to submit book chapters by international publishing houses. So this all started just because I joined the LTA. The various opportunities that came my way were as a result of, of that involvement. Finally, for my doctorate, it was really, really nice to, 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 um, to get into contact with people who shared my interest in my field of English medium instruction. And again, a lot of that contact came through this networking within the, the LTA. I said at the beginning of this section that you know, there's good and there's bad feedback. So I think it's not all self-congratulatory. Uh, and it's really important that if you are in a position where you are overseeing something, that you do make sure that you get feedback from uh, all stakeholders involved, just to make sure that people are happy with what's going on and whether they... Uh, suggest any changes so I, I do always try also in my you know my career now to, to solicit as much feedback as I can from the team who I am responsible for and we come to the final one the challenges um, it's all sounded quite rosy so far but of course there are challenges along the way and we have to decide how we're going to approach those challenges I would argue that in a voluntary organization, the challenges are difficult in some ways compared to work because the environment is different. So let's see what I came up with in my analysis. First of all, of course, challenges, we can't avoid them. And they, they can, often are stressful, but they can be rewarding learning opportunities too. So I really liked the language teacher association work. I, I really enjoyed doing it. I was very motivated. It doesn't mean there weren't challenges and there weren't stresses, but because I liked it so much, I said, right, I'm going to make sure that I don't overstretch myself. Because if I do and I start not to enjoy this because I'm doing too much, then I will stop doing something which I really, really love. So I really uh, had a very close control on the amount of work I put in. I didn't do too much. And I have really uh, started to apply this in my own working environment now. Okay, I think I'm more adept professionally at managing my expectations and workload by focusing on what I can do rather than what I want to do. Does this mean that I don't get stressed? No, it doesn't. Currently in my job, I'm going through quite a stressful time, but I will find ways to manage it. Whereas in the past, maybe I would have just like gone down a, neg a, a negative spiral of despair trying to, to do things which I couldn't do. Uh, also, I had to manage the special interest groups remotely. They were all over the, uh, the UAE. So that was interesting because it, it, it adds a new bow to the skills that, that you have in trying to manage because you're often managing over email or over Skype uh, or over the telephone. So a slightly different approach was needed to imbue trust and remove the sense of isolation that some people might feel if they're, if they're up in the, the Northern Emirates or the Western region in the UAE, for example. What's the washback for me here? Well, I, currently I'm working in a situation where I have teachers on different shifts and different campuses. So as you can imagine, that can be quite a challenge, but I feel that the LTA experience really has prepared me better for that. Another thing that uh, is a challenge is that volunteers are not employees. 
So with employees, you might uh, have a recruitment process and you'll try to find the best fit for your organization. A volunteer is doing this from the good of their heart, uh, but they may not be suitable volunteers for the work that you need to do. So the aligning of tasks to, uh, to, to various volunteers can be quite a challenge. And it requires patience if people are not quite able to do it or maybe can't do it. You don't want to sort of turn them away because they're volunteering. They're trying to be, uh, you know, trying to help. The washback for me in my work has, you know, is in the recruitment process. The importance of trying to get the right person for the positions that are available. We are currently starting our recruitment process now and I'm really sort of focusing on that to the hiring committee. That we don't want the best person on paper. We want the best person for our context. And that's really what uh, you need to focus on, I believe. Uh, another thing, another challenge, of course, is, is linked to the last point. Volunteers are not beholden to coercive power management styles. You can't force people to do stuff. Uh, and generally, you're going to come across a situation where there's a very communal culture in a voluntary organization. Often they are friends. And many of the people I work with, they were my friends. So getting into conflict for me was a big no-no. And that meant that sometimes I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do, but the relationship I, I feel was more important. However, conflicts are there. They form an uncomfortable part of, length of leadership and management. So they need to be faced in one way or the other. So my general approach in the LTA was uh, to go for a, uh, an accommodating conflict management style. Unless I was really sure we had to do something, I listened to the other person and where I could, I let them do what they wanted to do as long as it had some positive aspect for, for the organization. And I've, this is washed back into my work. I do aim for harmony and sometimes it's very difficult. I mean, you're a big team over there in SQU. We're not quite as big as you are, I think, but it's quite a big team. But I try to do my best in that regard. I'm not sure if it's successful. I'm not sure if I've got it quite right, but this is what I learned from the LTA. So this is what I try to apply. And I want to come back to returning to observing leaders. Um, it's, it was a really fascinating experience for me in the LTA to see the, the machinations of a nonprofit organization. And it was a real steep learning curve in relation to how nonprofit organizations can, can be highly politicized, just like any other kind of organization. So you feel sometimes that, uh, you know, sort of you can see the battles going on in meetings between different uh, factions. And um, yeah, it wasn't what I expected, I guess. I, I was expecting the altruistic sense of the organization to come through. But it was there, the altruism, of course, but definitely there was conflict. Definitely there was um, a, a political aspect to how the organization worked. So this required a political leadership approach, just like in, at work. You need to think about who you're talking to, what their position is, what their stance is, and let that lead your, your approach to that person. Otherwise, you would end up arguing and fighting, and of course, that's not beneficial for anybody. So I would say that altruism does drive the mood of a language teacher association, but conflict will also likely be present. So I come to the conclusion, and I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. So coming up, you know, McCaffrey says that effective leadership is as much contingent on context as it is on personal attributes and qualities. And I think that's very true. So every situation is different and you'll need to adapt to your, your leadership according to the context. That could be your leadership in the classroom. It could be your leadership as head of department. It could be your leadership as the head of, a, of an institution. I feel that my involvement in, LTA, in the LTA has definitely helped me to adopt and adapt certain skills and enhance them in the voluntary sector as well as my professional life. The feedback I've received, I feel has provided endorsement of what I was doing. It's made me internalize what I needed to adapt or where I needed to adapt my approach. And it gave me validation and evidence that I had developed. And that's really, really important. You need to feel that you have actually improved. There are key differences to workplace impacts on how one manages Sorry, there are key differences to how the workplace impacts on how one manages and leads, but one can inform the other. So although they are different, I have used some of my experiences from the workplace when I was volunteering, and likewise, when I was volunteering, I've also uh, used my experiences to help me in my current job. 
And of course, this kind of involvement does strengthen your, your leadership and management profile, which can lead to improved opportunities in the workplace at whatever level that might be. Finally, volunteer work is definitely not free from challenges, but one can learn from them. So final thoughts. I think it's worthy to note a couple of things here. Firstly, that even though a language teacher association can suffer from the same political machinations as large institutions, it does always maintain that great spirit of freedom and innovation, and is in my mind, therefore, a great breeding ground for the impl implementation of projects and ideas. So I would encourage people to join an LTA for this particular reason. It gives you the chance to grow and, you, and often you can select what you want to do. It's not mandated necessarily from above. You can put forward proposals. Secondly, I'm really grateful for my involvement with the Language Teacher Association, and I miss it. <laughs> and I'm also grateful for other opportunities that it gave me, and I really would recommend getting involved to anybody who has a desire to develop their leadership and management skills, or indeed any other skills in their personal or their professional lives. That's my lot, so thank you very much for listening. I hope it all went through clearly. And I'm happy to take any questions or receive any comments uh, if you have them. Thank you very much. Uh, because